So hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out on this last, last session of the last day. Um, I'm Christoph Pettis, and we're going to talk about scaling. Um, I've been, just as a quick background, I've been doing Postgres since 97-ish, yeah. Um, I work with a company called PostgreSQL Experts. We're based out of San Francisco, though we have consultants elsewhere. And at PostgreSQL, I'm, at PGX, I'm kind of the Django guy and the Amazon guy. The universe has a sense of humor because I got sort of like, did, um, started presenting about how much I disliked AWS. And so now I'm the one who gets all the AWS clients at uh, PGX. Uh, that's my email address, <coughs> and my Twitter is XOF. So this client came to us with this problem. Um, they, had, they had very serious scaling issues, but only some of the time. Really variable traffic. The, a lot of the time they're just cruising along, you know, not much happening, and then suddenly a thousand times over the course of minutes. Um, and unfortunately, it's largely unpredictable. It really, it was just in the middle of the night, suddenly something would happen that would drive everyone to their site. Again, my apologies for having to be a little bit vague, startup still in stealth mode, but you'll get the idea. Um, they have a very high chance of being slash dotted. So they needed to be prepared for that. Um, but the good news is their, um, re their read write pattern was a lot more reads than writes, even by general database standards. Um, the other good news is the application was greenfield development. So they were able to plan for this in advance, something not every application has the luxury of doing. Um, images, other static content, the CSS changed fairly infrequently, so that was easy to push onto a CDN. More good news. And um, their philosophy was it's better that once in a while, if something happens or the system gets overloaded, it's catching up in terms of demand. It was better to get a 500 page, um, you know, that, oh, sorry, could you click reload, please, the fail whale, than have a slow response where everyone's drumming their fingers saying, is this up, is, you know, and, and are be all dri being driven to, is it up for me or not? It, or is it down for everybody or just for me, I believe is the domain name. So the bad news was the queries were very, generally very simple, but they were very unpredictable. They, they were very hard to cache. So you couldn't say these are the top 20 queries, we'll just cache those results. You had to let the queries hit the database. Some of them were really high CPU because they were using PostGIS. And when the traffic bursts happened, they happened really quickly. Like in one to 10 minutes, it could go from a, a, load, a load of one, fairly, which you, know, you could probably handle on a single Linode, to 1,000 or 10,000 times that. So, hmm, OK, interesting problem. And occasional false positive spikes were not uncommon. The system would be running along, and then for a minute, it would do this and then come back down. Those are very hard to deal with, so I'm not sure we'd completely solve that problem. So what was the brief they gave us? They wanted to scale the computing resources up and down to meet the demand. Um, and they didn't want to just buy for the highest demand because that would have been ridiculous. Yes? How do you get to false positives? Well, it, it, um, mostly it's that um, what will happen is a link to their site will hit a large aggregator at some random time, and a lot of people will click through, and then it'll fall off the aggregator quickly. So that's, um, you know, it's not a false positive in the sense that the, the monitoring is wrong. That was probably not the best choice of terms. But it's not indicative of a large sustained load spike. Um, but they, 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 weren't, they weren't interested in buying for the highest possible demand, because that would have been thousands upon thousands of dollars continuously. And why, why waste that money? Um, they wanted reasonable fault tolerance in the case of DB failure. Reasonable for them was one to three minutes of downtime. Um, this is, as a sidebar, one thing that that's people always have, this is like this conversation that DB consultants have that every DB consultant can rattle off, which is you go and you say, how much downtime can you handle? They say, none. And they say, great, $25 million. And they'll say, what? And they say, if you want none, zero, no one will ever see an error. $25 million, give or take. And they say, how about for a minute of downtime? You know, because the, every, the, there's this exponential factor that the closer you get to zero, the more the money goes up. And it's asymptotic. It never, at, at, at true zero, it's very, very high. So fortunately, they had realistic expectations on that. And they also wanted business continuity in the case of disaster, like a meteorite destroys US, West, US East 1. Could happen. So given that, why AWS, especially at the beginning when I proclaimed my hostility to AWS? Well, you can't actually come up with a better use case for AWS. 
Um, AWS still has the best APIs for doing all this stuff. They're very, the, the APIs are very well documented, very high quality, very easy to use. Um, when you say give me a new instance, you get an instance pretty fast, um, usually in seconds. Um, and one, probably the single nicest thing about, AB, um, about AWS is the ability to snapshot an EBS volume into S3, and we'll show how that's used later. Um, so, while well, they're building their application, what do they use? Well, Nginx at the front end, because that's what all the cool kids use these days. Um, using uWSGI as the application container. Uh, Django was the application stack, because they wanted to use GeoDjango, and they were Python guys. Um, one nice thing about Django is it has multi, multiple database support, as of 1.3, I believe, um, which is really handy, and I'll show how we use that later. Um, the stack is a shared nothing stack. Each stack is autonomous, so each node contains Nginx, uWSGI, Django running inside of it as a self-contained unit. Um, high velocity data, things like counters, web sessions, that kind of thing, they were storing in Redis. So that didn't have to go to the database. Excellent decision. And because this was greenfield development, they were able to build it so that they created, um, how many people use Django at all? Just out of curiosity. Okay. Django, um, one of the things, you, you can create multiple database connections for the, the object relational manager, the ARM inside of Django. And so they were able to say, all our read queries go to this database connection, all our write queries go to this database connection. And that was a huge, that, was, that solved a, a multitude of problems. So that's where, how we used it, very nice. And because this was a new application, they were able to sort this out early. So requests are coming in. For the, for the application servers, just using the Elastic Load Balancer, because it's really very good for this kind of thing. Um, we, they, 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 in this case, not, not PGX, created um, AMIs with the whole application stack already baked into it, so it was very easy to provision a new one. And they used user data and Chef to push out the, um, the application to the newly provisioned host, basically pulling it straight out of the repo, launching it. It was great. This pretty much handled the front end load for them. They were able to um, scale it on the basis of CPU load, which was kind of, they used kind of as a proxy for how much, how busy the, um, the UWSGI server was. So that worked pretty well. No Postgres stuff yet. Um, just as a note, they built it, and this is a very, this is also very wise, with a cache first architecture, which is you always return the value of the cache. And then, if you think you need to recalculate the cache, invalidate it from the bottom up. There's a joke that the only two things about hard things in, in computer science are naming things and cache invalidation. Um, yes. All right, so I was, so, so I had, there were three instead of two, is what you're saying. Um, <laughs> Or, or, or. Um, so the, because their philosophy was it was better to return stale data, data quickly than to wait, have the users looking at the, um, looking at the progress bar waiting for the real data. The stale, you know, this was, they weren't returning you know, somebody's medical results here. It was okay to be, have slightly out of result data. Okay, so given all that, what do we use for the database stack? There's a master database. Um, it accepts all the writes in the system. Um, there are two or more streaming replica databases at any one time. Generally, all the reads go to there. Sometimes reads come out of there if they, in the limited cases they had to do immediate read after write, but we tried to minimize the number of those so that all the, so that, because that pretty much architected away, the idea was to ar application architectural replication lag problem away by just assuming that when you wrote data into the database, it could be a while before you read it out. For those very limited cases, where you had, they had to, we could direct the reads directly to the, the, the reads to the master database. Um, also, as it happens, the sort of the stylistic way of writing Django applications, you tend not to do a lot of read after writing, so it worked out okay. Um, each database was, is running on a 2M xlarge instance. Um, that was kind of the right trade off in terms of cost versus the size of the database at this particular time. Nothing magic about that. They could pick a larger one if they needed to. Uh, running on Ubuntu 12.04. And the data volume is on a single EBS volume. How many people, oops, nope, don't want to give that away yet. Um, how many people are rating their EBS? Few, okay. There are advantages to doing so, but there's one big advantage to having it on a single volume, which we'll talk about. So the whole stack kind of looks like this. Each app server has two connections to an HA proxy front end. 
Um, so you can see one goes to the master, one is load balanced across all the secondaries. There's one magic secondary called the air, which I'll talk about. So a bunch of secondaries. This note, there's an invisible dot, dot, dot. This could be larger or smaller, but there are always at least two secondaries. Absorb that. Think. So we obviously using streaming replication. That's what that arrow with thing with arrows at the bottom was. There's one secondary that's designated as the air. It runs using synchronous replication. Yes. No, on the same on the database machines. No, not particularly. I mean, it's um, the it talks to the database over socket over lo uh, local sockets. Yeah, rather than over the um, IP. And it's, you know, the performance hit, I'm sure, is non zero, but we didn't notice anything. Um, it runs using synchronous replication. And the reason for that is you always know that it is at least as far ahead as any other synchronous rep, as synchronous, um, synchronous secondary. Because of that, you know that you can always promote it to be the master and attach the other secondaries to it. So you don't have to re image them. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, but that has performance problems, doesn't it? And the answer is, you're absolutely right. It has performance problems. And I wish, um, we'll talk about that. The others use asynchronous replication. So they could be farther behind at any one moment. Yeah? Yes. It promotes another one to being the heir. There, and there is a race condition, a potential race condition there. You know, the, one of the things that we'll, we'll talk, there's, I probably have more problems with those architecture slides than presenting the architecture. So, but, uh, but yes, that is exactly a problem. If that, if the error goes down, obviously this, the whole system is still up, but there's a window where you may, where a cascading failure could it means you would have to re, you'd have to just pick one and re-image the others. So, if the master fails, we, we, the error is the designated successor to it. That's the name. Uh, we use HA proxy. We have two of them. Uh, the M instance provides a, basically its job is to provide a constant IP to the current master database, so the applications don't have to be bounced to point fit to, re, to if the master changes. Um, the S provides a constant IP and load balancing across all the secondaries. Well, okay, now we've just introduced two single points of failure. That's cool. Um, the, 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 HA, the proxy boxes do have warm standbys. So each one is shadowed by one that has an identical configuration but isn't actually active. Um, the problem is we're not running in VPC because they didn't want to pay for that. So we don't have virtual IPs, which means if one of these fails, we have to point the IP to the, to the warm standby, which means we have to do an application push. And everyone groans and thinks, oh my god, that sounds horrible. It, it, and it does sound horrible, but in, real, in reality, it's about the same downtime as a master database failure. So it's not disastrous. It's just uncomfortable. So we're using PG Bouncer. Each PG Bouncer, one PG Bouncer per database server. It runs on the database server itself, uses local sockets to talk to, to Postgres. Um, right now, Django opens a new connection on each web request. That's actually changing in 1.6. They're building in. Uh, re, um, persistent connections, but right now, every time you do a web request, it opens and closes a single connection. Um, so PG Bouncer helps um, reduce the connection overhead to the database. That's basically what it's there for. It will also help with the loading because we um, each database has a relatively sh small number of max connections set, which we'll talk about in a bit, and we allow more than that number of connections to come in and queue up inside the PG Bouncer. And they all run in transaction mode. So we're not doing any fa anything fancy that requires session mode. So here are the things that didn't work. PG pool 2, because we didn't have sufficient control over the pr uh, secondary promotion, because um, we need to promote the air and not anybody else in it. Um, for DB scaling elastic load balancer, there's a lot of moving parts to bring up a new Postgres database, and we just couldn't get that working right um, in an efficient way on Elastic Load Balancer. Maybe we just didn't understand it thoroughly enough, but there it was. Um, interestingly enough, my experience with provisioned IOPS is that over, um, over the grand sweep of history, 
they're slower than the non-provisioned product because you have to, there's this little asterisk on provisioned IOPS. And you read about this asterisk and it says, well, you only get the guarantee if your IOQ is a sufficient depth, I believe it's eight transactions, and all the blocks are 8K or more, and, oh, by the way, this is a cap, not just a floor. You never get faster than the provisioned IOPS product. Now, if you're experiencing, if, you, if Reddit's moved in next door into your EBS server and is having a party there, then provisioned IOPS is great because you're probably getting horrible performance off of EBS. Um, however, over, generally, EBS runs faster than that. You have to remember that the maximum provisioned IOPS speed is 100, um, is 100 transactions a sec, is, um, operations a second, or 1,000, I'm sorry. That's five, megabyte, mits, 5 megabits per second. In 2013, 5 megabits per second does not blow me away as a storage speed. Um, yep. Is it documented? Yeah. Where? Uh, in, on the uh, website. OK. I just was there this morning confirming this. I didn't uh, see anything in the English language documentation. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's a lot PG Pool has that's not <laughs> that's, that, I, that unfortunately it's hard to figure out. That's possibly true. But anyway, I, I'm sure, you know, I, be, I believe you. It's just it be very hard to find PG Pool tools features. Um, so we set relatively low max connections. I believe that right now they're set to 50. Um, the reason for this is there's this philo um, max connections is an interesting number. Is I'll go into a oops, let's talk, make sure we focus here. Go into a database and max connections is set to a thousand. And I'll say, well, okay. And they say, why is that set to that? It says, well, we didn't want any refused connections. Okay, you probably won't get them with it set to a thousand. Can this database really handle 1,000 running queries at the same time? No, no. So why would you want these connections not to be refused? I mean, philosophically, I think it's always better to get a hard, crisp error than the whole thing just starts melting down slowly over time. So that was the philosophy here, especially with PG Bouncer in front of it, where they can queue up rather than just be refused. I think that's a better choice. Um, so let's see. Um, there's SSL between HA proxy and the application, and HA proxy and PG Bouncer using Stunnel, um, because HA proxy does now support um, SSL. At the time it was being spec'd out, it didn't. Um, it's also as less. I, I think it's still in the dev branch. I'm not sure if it's in a release branch yet. Um, this is, and since this isn't, isn't being run in a VPC, these are basically public IPs to anybody inside of Amazon's cloud, and so we need SSL. So that's another moving part. Is that the well, there's two hops because HA proxy is a separate box. So we, um, we, but yeah, we only we have to use it. We have to use it both places because HA proxy by itself doesn't support SSL. So the Django, the the, the app, the Django app servers can connect using SSL just fine because libpq supports it uh, if you have open SSL compiled in. But so we have to do two, basically two S tunnel hops, uh, which is annoying. Um, right now, the good news is database fits more or less in memory, which is, um, so the two, our tuning generally reflects that. We have a fairly aggressive setting on, on things like CPU tuple costs and stuff like that. Uh, replication. So masters just do the standard stream replication thing. Um, the wall segments are shipped to a central server via rsync. Um, we don't ship them directly to the secondaries, distribute them secondaries. We just push them all into a central server. And then they pull the wall segments from as required also using rsync. So, <clears throat> um, oops. and inevitably, I do this once per, at least once. And the segments then are, per, you know, so now they're piling up on the central server. We have, and they're deleted via heuristic, which is we take a wild guess at how, at how long. It's right now like 10 days, and then we drop them. Unfortunately, you can imagine, I, I sort of was concocting this scenario where um, the, archive, the archive cleanup command, instead of actually doing the delete, could like notify the central server, oh, I've gotten to this far and all that, and I realized I really needed to sit down for a moment because I was obviously going crazy. Um, so right now we just like do a find minus M10. 
oh, well, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, uh, but hold that thought. Um, there is a, a server which actually happens to run on the same server that's piling up all these wall segments called the controller, um, otherwise known as the server who knew too much. Um, it's the one that monitors the health of the Postgres databases. Um, it uses a rolling average of connections of, of active of connections that are actually doing work as a as a as its proxy for the server load. So it's doing it's basically pinging stat activity on a regular basis. And when it exceeds the threshold, it decides, okay, time to spin up a new database server. Um, we also do Nagios for short-term alerts, like check folks with Ganglia for long-term stats graphing for short-term. And then New Relic for strategic stuff. New Relic is great, but it's not a this flamed out, please fix it kind of thing. It's more of a general health of the server kind of stuff. And the controller does its custom monitoring. It also happens to auto-kill any idle transactions that it sees. If there's an idle transaction that's been more than a couple minutes since the last query, it kills it. Just, you know, why not? Because <laughs> these are unfortunately notorious in Django. Um, Monitor versus Django, this app hasn't, hasn't really had a problem with it. But once in a while, you'll see one, and so why not? OK, so it's decided it needs more. It, it's, it's watching this load, and it's creeping up. It's fairly aggressive, um, so, because it wants to anticipate these load, si these load spikes. So we request a new instance from Amazon. We try to balance them across the AZs. The one firm rule is that the error and the master are never in the same availability zone, because that's the only way of absolutely guaranteeing that a hardware failure isn't going to take both down at the same time. Um, we provision the new secondary with all the various components. Right now, we use a combination of user data and Chef to provision it. We really should be build, We should really should bake up an AMI for this. We haven't yet, but that's that'll that'll happen. Um, and. After a short bootstrap, we just use Chef and install everything. I, uh, it's a combination that's like, sometimes Chef calls out to Python, and it's like all very wild. <laughs> um, then the magic. This is, why, this is why it's cool to be on Amazon. You should start backup. You take the snapshot of the, EB, of the master's EBS volume. Do a stop backup. Um, you now have a copy of this in S3. You mount it on the new secondary as its database volume. And you fire up the database. And assuming everything's set up correctly, one hopes, it just works. Starts up, starts pulling the wall segments in off of the other server. It, it enters recovery mode, pulls all the up, wall segments to catch up, connects to the master, and it works. Yes? Well, yeah. I mean, it's um, so far we haven't had that trouble. But right now, what we, um, I will say right now, what we do is if this doesn't work, we throw away the whole thing and do it again. And the other thing is really funny is uh, the connection between the zones is faster than the connection between the chef and the EBS request. So it's maybe the RC between the zone is faster than you need to. Yeah. Right well, we'll talk about what happens if this doesn't work, which it, and it doesn't, um, and then we attach the new one to HA proxy like this, and we're off to the races. Um, hmm? uh, we'll talk about that. Um, we have to patch the master's HBA conf to re allow a replication connections to the new secondary. A better way probably of doing this is with certificates, um, and we should implement this, because that way we don't have to do this, you know, going in and grepping the text file nonsense, which is, you know, gives me heartburn. Um, we keep the snapshot around, because why not? You know, S3 is cheap. And you know, over the course of a couple of weeks, we clean up old snapshots because we figure we're not going to use them anymore. So the good news, two to 10 minutes. It's generally how long it takes to fire up a new server. More, and it's more like a decay curve than a bell, than a bell curve. So generally, we have a new server within two, within two to four minutes, which is pretty good. Um, once we connect it, the load relief is really quite dramatic. Bonk. It really it, it helps a lot right away. So that's good. And. We generally, we're generally paranoid about load estimation. It's like as soon as this spike goes go, we, we like every, all the alarm bells ring and we start creating database servers. That's actually worked out pretty well. <laughs> so I was worried I'd be spending too much money, but no, that worked fine. So the bad news. You know, they're really well documented, and they're really easy to use, and damn, they, have a lot, they frequently don't work. Um, for example, 
They will claim success when, in fact, the operation did not complete. I will get back a volume ID, and I will then say, great, mount this volume ID. And they say, are you crazy? There's no such volume ID. I'll go into the console, and there's the volume ID. And I'll say, no, that volume ID. They say, what volume ID? And I reload the console, the volume ID is gone. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, it can record a bad status even when it does complete. This is actually the most common one. Like the, like the API will be stuck saying creating on, a, um, on an EBS volume. And, there, and, it, and you go into the console, it's like, what? It's ready to attach. Why aren't you attaching this? What, are you stupid? And you try and attach it, and then the API gives you an error. It's, it's so it, now, to be honest, this is not, this is 1% of calls, if that. This is not 50% of calls. But when you're automating something, you really remember that 1%. Um, and occasionally, and what's most frustrating is you'll get an instance, you'll, it'll come up, it'll be, and it, it will just not be right. You know, it'll kind of be the runs of the litter. You'll try to attach an EBS volume to it, and it won't work. It'll like go away for a little while, then come back and say, what? I'm right here. You know, and so and that's, that's the most frustrating one, because you don't know until, you know until you start doing things with the instance that's just kind of wrong in the head. I, uh, one percent. You know, I really don't know the exact number, but I w it's under one percent of the calls are behaving in some really odd way, where it's not a crisp. I mean, I have no problem when I say do this and it says no error. That's that's fine. I don't consider that a failure unless the error, unless it's completely wrong. You know, unless, as long as the backing data is correct. These are. I would say it's under one percent of calls where I ask it to do something, it says no, and but it seems to be out of sync with reality for some reason. Well, what we do is this, the zero tolerance solution. If anything weird happens, we just trash whatever we're doing and start over from scratch. That's the answer. Something doesn't attach, we destroy the instance, go back to the very beginning and try again. Um, you know, I'm not going to write 5,000 lines of Python to try to get do exactly the right thing, and I'm not sure I could even if I wanted to. Um, you know, basically, go back to the last known state, start it later. It's also much easier to code that way. Yeah, and I mean that's where the ten-minute thing kind of happens. <laughs> that's where the end of the bell curve, the end of this decay curve, kind of happens. Is where those things. The good news is we rarely get stuck in the, in this continuous loop of just doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. That has happened sometimes, but only when the region was having a problem. And if the region's having a problem, the region's having a problem. So, okay, we've watched the decay curve comes down, and we decide to spin one of these down. Um, we have a much longer rolling average for, for spin down, you know, in part so we're not flapping them up and down, but also, um, um, also because we don't want to be fooled by you know, a saddle shape. So we use a first added, first removed policy. One of the reasons for this is if we added an instance a long time ago and it's still running, we don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> we kind of trust that instance and we like it. Um, so we remove it from HA proxy, wait for the load default to zero. We don't wait too long. At some point, we just decide, look, you've had your time to finish these things, and we kill it. And um, we destroy the instance and remove it from the master's pga.conf. This is another reason that long-running processes tend to be rooted to the, the master, because the master is never destroyed, unless it fails. OK, yeah? If we go back, is it first added, first removed, or is it the one that took the longest running um, I'm sorry, that should be last added, first removed. Yeah, that's, that's an error. Thank you. That's, I need more coffee. Everyone taking notes, correct that. Thank you. OK, the master fails. First thing we do is we destroy the old master. Bonk. Assuming, you know, assuming, there's, assuming Amazon hasn't destroyed it for us already. Um, we remove the old master from, you know, one of the things about uh, instances is don't get attached to them. They're not your friends. Um, you know, Amazon will just say, oh, that instance? You know, things happen. You know, it's, you know, Got sent to the it got sent to the farm, you know. So there, you have to be careful about that stuff. Anyway, remove the old, uh, old master from proxy uh, from the master proxy. It removes the error from the proxy. Sites down at this point. Okay. Error page. Bonk. Um, we do the promotion. You know, set the trigger file. Bonk. Up it comes. Um, and then the controller is running along the mad thing, patching half the system. Um, for, you know, we're, we we point the the master proxy at it. Uh, we reconnect all the other masters to the new IP address, the, the old secondaries to the new IP address, and have them catch up. Sometimes they will fail to reconnect. I'm not exactly sure why that happens, but in which case we just destroy them and 
put them back. I'm sure it's not their fault, nothing personal. But um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a tedious process, but generally it works quite, it, but despite the number of odd steps, it works like, um, it works pretty well. Now, so what do we get in real life? It, on the average, it takes about 75 seconds for the error page to go away, for the app to come back up after, the master, after we detect the master failure. This is important because, ma because oh, as we'll talk about later, it's rarely as, as good as suddenly the cable gets cut. You know? So far, we have not had one of these not work. Now, it doesn't happen very often, but even in testing, when we pull the, when we, when we pull the plug, we've, we've done, so far we've done pulling the plug, overloading it, and force, um, disconnecting the EBS volume as ways of, of forcing a failure, since EBS volumes do force disconnect sometimes on their own. Um, but ask me again in a year <laughs> how well this is working. Seems to work so far, but you know. Okay, secondary fails. We just destroy it, no reason to keep it around, yeah. Um, what, what we do, um, I, right now what we do is, if the controller either can't connect to it at all, obviously, or a simple query takes longer than a set threshold, which is right now three seconds for a select one, we just decide, we don't know what's going on, it's just too weird, let's redo it. Um, the, um, that's not very sophisticated, but it seems to work out okay, you know. Um, the, but as we'll talk about, it's, you know, unfortunately it's rare that a bot, boxes don't just, explode, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. They get sick, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, spin up the new secondary. Um, we're more concerned about zombie secondaries than false positives. I'd rather destroy a secondary um, that was actually healthy and working, rather than have a, have a secondary come around that's not that I can't trust. Um, so yeah, AWS is not for the sentimental. It's a, it's a bad world out there. Okay, so um, if there's a failure, a new secondary is created. Um, uh, um, either either the error fails or the ma it's been promoted. There is a race condition right now. If the new mass, if you've promoted the error, but the new error, but a new error is not online, and that and that one you just promoted fails, that's something a human being has to deal with right now. The scripting is not smart enough to deal with that situation. Fortunately, that's we're getting into cosmic ray level events at that point, which is good. So, of course, you know if this starts happening on a regular basis, I'll completely change my tune. But at the moment, that seems okay. So, a little more about this controller thing. It's a Python application. It has a local Postgres database to keep track of stuff like you know what what's going on in the system. Um, it has its own warm standby in the case of failure. Um, Right now, if the controller fails, that's something else that a human being has to roll over. Um, the good news is, if the controller fails, the system itself keeps running. Nothing bad happens as far as the system goes. It just means their failures will go undetected until we bring it back. Other failures will go undetected. The stuff of nightmares is what happens if we have one of these rolling failures that machine after machine starts dying and the controller happens to be the first one. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but that is, that is a contingency we're going to have to start planning for. Okay, um, disaster recovery, like loss of region, you know, things happen. Um, you know, rather large storm did just crash into the eastern seaboard. Um, so we, the snapshots that we're taking, we occasionally, we shipped S3 buckets in different regions, in, um, in different regions. We gather, compress, and archive the wall segments that are chronologically related to them, S3. Um, and right now the retention strategy for those is we'll worry about it when the bill gets too big. Um, so we're keeping them. Ultimately what I want to do is start shipping them over so there's a cold standby in another region that we can just push a button and bring back up. Um, also to do point in time recovery to, for those. You know, for the site gets hacked, somebody pushes out a bad migration and drops a table they shouldn't have, you know, all that stuff that streaming replication does not protect you against. So this has random benefits. Um, we can resize these things really easily just by changing the parameter for what instance size you want and start you know, recreate stuff and roll stuff over. Um, it's easy to scale up manually. You just go to the controller and say, you know, you, how you're keeping two, you know, you have a minimum of two, let's make that minimum of six just because I have a bad feeling about this weekend. 
Um, and you pretty much get your own backup. The backup strategy is pretty well handled by this, including point in time recovery, which is very, yeah, point in time recovery is very important from a business continuity point of view. You need that because all the streaming replication in the world does not protect you against failures that the database considers correct, but a human being doesn't consider correct, like dropping an important table. So um, we were able to go to 10 secondaries right now without, without um, really noticing anything at all. Above 10, the load does start to get noticeable, mostly disk I.O. Um, right now, the ratio is about, about every five front-end servers, we tend to add another database. I'm not sure what this, I don't know what this means, but there it is. Um, it's uh, above 15, the, the master stops becoming useful. So that's destruction testing on it. So that's an interesting number. Um, in real life, we don't expect this the secondaries to go much above seven. That seems to be about where, um, at that point, we can, you know, pretty much the site can handle whatever's being thrown at it. So why I don't like my architecture. There are a lot of moving parts in this, and that makes me nervous. There's this controller thing. There's HA proxies. There's this all this stuff, and you know, everything is something that can fail, and it has to have a secondary, and has to have a failover strategy. And after a while, you start getting heartburn about it. Still, too many failure modes that require manual intervention, especially multiple multiple node failures of very you know of not so much like two secondaries go down. System handles that fine, but the controller and one of the HA proxies goes down. Or something, you know, well, those kinds of combination modes. There are too many of them. The, the system can get in, get wedged in a way that requires manual intervention. And there are just too many places there are these heuristics or timeouts or educated guesses about the way things work. And that makes me uncomfortable. It works, but, you know, working is a relative term. And a whole AZ going down, I have no idea what would happen in those cases. Um, but, um, and I'm using this kind of as a proxy for a large number of nodes all die at once. Or we have one of these rolling failures where nodes die, especially if they die in a bad order from the ar architecture point of view. So some of the challenges we ran into for this, first let's say AWS. You know, I love the APIs, I just wish they would always work the way they say they work, or if they're going to fail, they fail cleanly and accurately. That's a problem. You know, I have to put this stuff into my code, and I'm personally deeply offended that in 2013, I'm having to say time wait nine to get something to work on an API, a web API. I mean, come on, we're all grownups here. Um, you know, and so far there's no good solution except you assume the worst, you assume everything's in some horrible state, and you go back as far as you can without losing data and try again. <sighs> ah, drives me crazy. Um, some infrastructure stuff. Um, you know, this Django, this tunnel, blah, 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 blah. Come on, you know? Just build it, you know, HA proxy fully supporting SSL would solve a lot of this stuff. PG Bouncer supporting SSL would solve a lot of this stuff. Um, you can end up with a dangerous combination of instances and AZs right now where too many instances are on the same AZ and that makes me nervous. No, that's an issue. Um, I'm worried about network ingestion with all this stuff flying back and forth, all, all these secondaries and all this traffic. So far, I ha that we haven't run into it, but I'm still nervous about it, given that they're not running on a VPC or, or a cluster. You know, one of the frustrating things is, you say, well, we're monitoring the machine. So if the machine dies, we'll understand. But that's a little bit like saying, well, we'll we're, we're going to tell if a person's sick because we can see their skull in front of us. That's not the way machine, machines don't die suddenly any more than people do. They start getting weird. They, they, go, they, they go away for a while, then come back. You think, hmm, I wonder what that was about. Or the, the EBS volume dismounts, and you go, well, shit, that wasn't good, and remount it, and everything seems fine. So that's the problem, is that monitoring you, requires these sometimes impossible to determine <laughs> heuristics for whether or not a machine is really dead. Fortunately, um, you know, they get sick, they start behaving oddly. It's really hard to write a perfect test that says, which side of the grave is this machine on? Do we trust it or don't we? Um, so right now, we basically adopt a zero tolerance policy. It's easier to get a new machine and just forget it and try again than to, um, than to, than to um, get really super detailed, you know, start taking its pulse and putting a thermometer in and all that stuff. The controller. 
you know, it works. I kind of like it. But, you know, it just doesn't feel right to be as an architect. It's somewhat a single point of failure. I mean, it has a backup and all that stuff. But it's just um, one single process. It always makes me nervous when I have a single thing doing high availability. You know, that's, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and the problem is it has, ac it has to have access to everything, so it has all these keys on it. It has to go around and rewrite configuration files all the time. And that's just, you know, messy. Um, I would love this to be fully distributed and kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know it, 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 so that um, I haven't, but haven't found a practical way of doing that that meets all the needs. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Right now, they're using almost exclusively on-demand instances, so it's kind of not an issue. They're basically they're creating and deleting them on the fly. They assure me this is the right billing model for them. It's not my checkbook, so I, you know, that's. Uh, I would probably, um, I would probably reserve like the core instances, the stuff I know is going to be up all the time. You know, like a certain number of web servers, the controller, its shadow, the HA proxies, their shadows, to you know the database server, it's at this. Run those all in reserved instances, and then use on-demand instances for the rest of the stuff. That's probably you know if it were my checkbook. So, you know, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, actually, why not, we're pretty close to the end. I think we're okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Recording, recording. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to run over, so why don't we, yeah, we'll just keep going. Um, the, you know, PGConf, you know, is great if you're a human being. If you're not a human being, grepping around inside of it to control Postgres gets to be a really tedious way of handling things. You know, it's not great for automated configuring. One of the things that also bugs me is right now we have a cyclic dependency between the master and the secondary, so we need to have both IP addresses before we can do the installation because of, uh, because of hba.conf on the master. Had we reserved IPs and things like that, we could get around that problem. Right now we don't. Also, one of the things that just bugs me is Ubuntu standard packaging starts the server. I wish it didn't do that because I have to tear it down because I have to move it around and things like that. Is there? Okay, great. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's just say when a 9.3 comes out and I have to roll this thing forward, because I know I'm going to be the one to have to do it. You built it, you fix it. Um, the problem is, it's all stream replication. It all has to be the same major version. It doesn't that sound jolly? Um, so am I, you know, I'll have to do something like this, and I'm trying not to think about it. It makes me, it hurts. But yeah, this is going to be an issue with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I suspect they're going to want to upgrade before then, sadly. Um, the stream replication does hit the right performance on the master. Um, and specifically, the, um, there's, there's actually two points rolled into one here. There's the, there's the load on the master, and there's also the um, synchronous rep. On for the air, and that really hits right performance. A lot of the high write operations are moved into celery driven queues so the user doesn't have to sit there and wait for them. It'll just send the thing in and come back and say, here's your stale data. Or it will construct a, it'll construct a faux page that wasn't actually done by a database query. Um, all very clever, kind of hacky. Um, one possibility I need to time this out is to move to cascading replication a model where the air is the first level of cascade and the other secondaries. Um, however, the rewiring in the case of a promotion here is going to be even more challenging. So uh, I need to see how this will work. And general scaling stuff. Ultimately, we're going to hit an I.O. limit on the master. This is where it always falls apart. And unfortunately, on Amazon, it falls apart earlier than it does on other systems. Um, because all of this stuff helps the read, doesn't do you much good on the write. Um, and unfortunately, if we raid the EBS, it takes away the ability to do the snapshotting. Sigh. Um, and we can't go to instant storage for the same reason. We can't snapshot instant storage. Hmm. 
And oh, by the way, there's a one terabyte limit on EBS volume. So we can watch that red needle creep up. Yeah. So we'll just, post post XC better be done before any of this becomes a problem. Um, let's see, little stuff that we want to do. Create AMIs for the database machine so we don't have to reprovision them. That'll cut some time off of, off of it. Move to a VPC, oops. Move to a VPC for both for security. We might even be able to drop the Stunnel stuff if we wanted to. And we, we get our own IPs to assign, which will be much nicer because it eliminates the cyclic dependency weirdness that we're having to put up with. Um, cluster the instances so we get a private network between them. That'll be much nicer. I mean, these nice fast channels will be very pleasant. And uh, ultimately, we're going to have to do something. Shard it, something like that. Fortunately, right now, the database is relatively small, so we have time. But eventually, something is going to have to happen there. So I came up with a little wish list based on this is. I would really love that I didn't have to grep text files to do this stuff. I mean, come on, 2013, you know, web interface, web, you know, web service. Um, what I want is PG Bouncer with just enough PG Pool 2. You know, just, just the, the, the um, w with, of course, my, my pet feature set because it's me asking. Um, the, um, with, with just the, 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 st the streaming replication failover stuff, but otherwise it's PG Bouncer. It's lib event based, you know, single pool, you know, very nice and fast. That would be, that's, that's the tool I wanted but didn't get. Um, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> open SS, I mean, I don't care about the politics, just compile with OpenSSL already. Um, and uh, yeah, and please give me reliable results from this, even if it means I think there was a failure, so here's your failure already, and you can rely the, on this failure. That would be really nice. <clears throat> so now that we know this, what do we know? As a professor of mine used to say. Um, you know, the, I think the big mistake people use on Amazon is they think of it as a machine rental service. It's a really expensive machine rental service. Instances, you pay a lot for an instance for, for what you get out of Amazon. But if you think of it as a compute, as, as a compute resource service where you say, I need some compute, computation for a while. Could you, could you give me a machine for as long as I need it? It can actually be very cost effective. And Amazon is the best so far at handing you these dynamic resources and taking them back. Um, we can do this. Required a lot of infrastructure, but we did it. Um, the right side still gives me nightmares. You know, that's, that's a problem, is, is, how to, is that when you hit the right limit, suddenly the architecture balloons in terms of complexity. And great, any questions? I just assume it's a normal failure. Yeah, um, the uh, the and that that does happen. Um, I would say probably that is at, that that vies for the most frequent failure mode actually. Then the, that um, Amazon that the, the VM just disappears for some reason. The really annoying one is where they migrate it, but they don't migrate it just right. Like they'll migrate it, but the EBS volume won't be attached, and things like that. For those, we just assume assume instance destruction. We could do heroics of like trying to find the EBS volume and reattach it and do things like that. Like you know, like I want to go home at some point, so <laughs> I decided not to, not to try for that. I mean, it is absolutely unquestionable that with you know, if somebody younger and stronger than I am could probably um, handle a lot of these edge cases. But overall, I think it was easier to you know, as uh, I was easier to for me to just feel you know, maybe because I'm a database guy, I felt like. I know it's a transaction. I'll, I'll abort. I'll just roll back to the last good known state and try again. <laughs> and the um, it does mean actually once in a while a human being has to go and delete some stuff out of the console because it's things we've lost track of for some reason. Usually EBS volumes because the instance is detached. It's detached from the instance and we've lost track of it. That's something we can add to the controller at some point. Is go through and start cleaning up unattached instances. I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now, now we're at twenty megabits per second. Yeah. So we're no longer. So we have we have broken through the flash the 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 USB flash key barrier, which is. <laughs> any, uh, yeah. <laughs> um,
um, we I considered it the the load balancer qual the 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 problem. I was actually as I was preparing these slides, I was trying to remember exactly why I because for the front end we are using the load balancer. Um, It's, uh, I mean, uh, at this point, I'm going to have to be a little bit lame and say it seemed like a good idea at the time. There, there was a compelling reason I am not remembering. Um, but um, we couldn't use the full elastic compute thing, you know, the, or the full, the full um, um, auto scaling stuff because there were just way too moving parts in bringing up and attaching the Postgres instance. That, that part's pretty self-explanatory. Why we use HA proxy instead of that, instead of the, um, is one that's a little bit lost to my memory. So, but that, so maybe, you know, could have gotten it wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's so. No, actually, I haven't. So, if you, if those, uh, those have escaped my attention, so drop me a note or some, you know, exactly. ping me on Twitter or something. Yeah. I have not encountered any EBS corruption, although I have certainly heard of it. Um, that's a good reason to move to 9.3, um, then you have checks coming. Um, we do, the, the usual EBS failure mode is, a, is, a, is an inexplicable force disconnect from the, is that especially on, uh, um, well, he, there's sort of the or example is, Amazon will decide to work on a rack, and so they'll, the, and they'll, boot, your, and they'll boot your instance. It'll come back up, and the EBS volume won't reattach. And sometimes the EBS volume will be there. Sometimes it even won't. The, and that's you know we treat that as an instance failure. You know if, if either the EBS volume or the instance itself fails. I um, but I can certainly imagine a corruption. I mean, there's lots of moving parts in EBS. So. Uh, oh, It's you know as as far as I'm concerned, it's a disk. It's not even a rated disk. It's just a disk. It's a it's a it's a bare spinning disk, and you just treat it like that. Yeah. You know that's um, the good news is you know that that hopefully you have you know um, a corruption an undetected corruption that got into the snapshot and all that kind of stuff would be pretty bad. I haven't encountered one of those. Um, this is a good reason that nine three has checksums, and I am certainly going to turn them on the instant we roll to nine three. Anything else? Great, thank you. Oh, yeah. Is the um, potential server for the wall setting the same kind of failure? Nominally, yes. Because now it's keeping them on EBS, it's keeping them on EBS, so in theory that's reliable. Um, it's not a single point of failure in that the, um, the, the system operation won't be compromised. If it, it does mean a human being has to go put on their galoshes and start and, re, and repair the situation. Um, and that's something that we, that's kind of one of those things we haven't gotten around to yet. Um, you know, it is um, the, because generally one, um, the, the system, the, um, the secondaries only actually need that if they're doing a recovery or they're being primed, you know, when they're first starting up to, to recover the wall segments for the disconnect period. Um, you know, the period from, from the end back, from the, from the start back up to, um, to now. Um, so it will, this, that's one of the parts of this cascading failure mode that, that kind of makes me nervous. It's like if that's the first machine that comes down and then a secondary goes down and that kind of thing. Um, hasn't been a problem so far, but yeah, that's something we probably could use some work on. Well, they're not they're not they're not mounted to the to the secondaries. It's our syncing them to and fro. Yeah. Now the, we do actually have a way of gathering the information. This is what I mentioned because um, each secondary is call could call. There's this there's the archive cleanup command, which it runs to say, I'm done I'm done with everything before this wall segment. In theory, we could collect that information. We could it, you know what's supposed to happen is you run pg archive cleanup and it deletes the stuff. But it can be any command. 
it could communicate to the, the archive server and say, OK, this secondary is now done from this point onward. It could integrate that data and then release it automatically. That sounds like real work. Compared to a find, you know, minus m plus 10 dash delete, that sounds like real work. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you very much.